my talk today is is uh, aimed at a very general audience. It, it's not a talk for people who have a a good knowledge of of a good working knowledge of ceramics, but uh, really to what I would like to do is to introduce people who are not aware of the range of ways in which ceramics can be studied and the way in which they can contribute to our knowledge of cultural history. Um, I hope that by the end of this talk, they will have uh, picked up a little bit. And I'm going to open my talk with a quotation from the book of Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he re reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. The potter and his clay metaphor is common as an image of creation found throughout the books of the Hebrew Bible and in the ancient Near East. Oh, sorry, I have to, a different way to go forward. Right. The potter and, oh, sorry, we've done this. One of the earliest deities in the Egyptian panoply of the gods is Knum, the divine potter, who's illustrated creating mankind on a potter's wheel, as you can see here. And these references serve to remind us of both the great antiquity and the importance of ceramics in human civilization. Of all the material finds from archeological investigations, Ceramics are the most numerous. In religious settings, clay could form images of a deity or special ceramic vessels for ritual use, or in a Byzantine context, decoration in churches. But it is in domestic contexts that they're particularly numerous. They encompass vessels for eating and drinking, vessels involved in the preparation of food, including highly valued fireproof cooking pots, vessels for medium-term storage and larger ones for long-term storage, and vessels for transporting commodities from place of production to place of consumption. Together with utilitarian ceramics such as roof tiles and water pipes, these groups form the bulk of ceramic finds in domestic and archaeological contexts. While ceramics can be used to identify human activity, Typologies are needed to place those activities in context and chronologies to situate those contexts in time. Byzantine domestic ceramics are probably best known through their wonderfully colorful bowls like these. The collectability of bowls like this meant that initial publications were of collections of pretty vessels in museums rather than broken pieces from excavations. And one of the earliest publications was Wolf's ornate and lavish publication of pottery from Constantinople in the Kaiser Frederick Museum in Berlin, which became the standard reference work for Byzantine ceramics for many years. Now pottery from archeological contexts is rarely recovered complete and small shards like this can be difficult to equate with the often perfect dishes and jugs on display in museums. And one of the primary skills of a ceramic specialist is to recognize complete forms from shards with which they are presented. And I must point out that these are really quite uh, pretty examples of shards. Um, the ma overwhelming majority of shards that one is presented with are small undecorated body shards. In its early years, Byzantine archaeology per se focused on Constantinople for obvious reasons, so that early ceramic studies were concentrated there. 
the excavations in the Hippodrome in 1927 and 1928 unearthed a wide range of pottery which prompted David Talbot Rice to produce his innovative and influential Byzantine ceramics book in 1930. He cross-referenced some of the types in the of the Byzantine pottery that had been published from ancient Sparta in southern Greece, drawing on the chronology identified there. And too many excavations of classical cities with heavy overlays of Byzantine deposits have not delivered even the slimmest of reports of the later pottery, which has hindered greatly the development of Byzantine ceramic studies. In addition, few major excavations outside Constantinople have been initiated with investigation of medieval remains as their primary purpose. Standing Byzantine monuments in provincial cities of the empire are usually churches whose excavation, even if permitted since many were and are active religious centers, does not often yield plentiful ceramics. A fire at Constantinople in the early 20th century uncovered a section of the Great Palace, the main residence of emperors from the fourth to the 11th centuries, offering access to the material culture of the most elite level of Byzantine society over a long period. Large scale excavations of the palace led to two further important publications of pottery from Constantinople. In 1947 by Stevenson and in 1958 by Talbot Rice. Excavations at Romanus Lecapinus's palace of the Miria Leon produced a short pottery report. And restoration work on one of the earliest churches of Constantinople, Ayarini, led to the first publication from the city of a large corpus of pottery of one type, whitewares, subsequently shown to be made from the natural kaolinitic clays found in the city. Publication of excavations at the Kalenderhame Jami, the site of a series of Byzantine churches from the sixth century to the Ottoman conquest, presented a summary of a much longer pottery report, which covered material from nine centuries. Then, 70 years after Talbot Rice's Byzantine ceramics, a comprehensive publication of 350,000 plus ceramics from excavations in the Sarachane district of the city at the site of the Church of St. Polyuctus appeared dating from Roman to Ottoman times. And that authoritative volume set out the principal types of ceramics in use in the city across these centuries so that it has become a standard reference work. After the healthy initial foray into Byzantine ceramics, based on excavations of the monumental buildings of Constantinople. The city was subsequently poorly represented in pottery studies until the Sarachane publication. Talbot Rice had identified the three basic systems on which typologies can be based, form or shape, decoration and fabric, but discounted form for the material he was working on because the majority of the pieces were too close in shape for serious differentiation. And the reason they were too close in shape is actually because they were all quite close in date and there hadn't been a development in many of the forms. Although Talbot Rice's primary division was based on fabric, it was a simplistic allocation between red and white fabrics with no further attempt to distinguish within these broad colour boundaries. With more confidence in fabric recognition, a more sophisticated structure for the fabric types might have been developed. John Hay studied approximately 20,000 shards with white fabrics from the Sirachene excavations, on which basis he proposed a classification based on subdivisions within the fabric, identifying macroscopically five different fabrics, all from Constantinople, in use at different periods, which has been adopted as the standard reference. And Talbot Rice's classification, which I've shown you here, was principally art historical and based on decoration. 
And many places around the Mediterranean and Black Seas produced pottery with red fabrics, but there are very few locations with access to good white clays. And Constantinople was just one such place with plentiful kaolinitic clay beds from which excellent quality domestic pottery can be made. And the area within the city where pottery was made remained elusive until excavations began for the new metro city, the system in the modern city. And these excavations showed that modern circuitry, which was the Genoese quarter in Byzantine times, and we're talking here, was where both red and white bodied glazed ceramics were made. And this was very convenient it was very convenient because it was close to where you could sell pottery within Constantinople and very close to where you could load it onto ships to transport it abroad. So um, These are, these are examples of the red bodied ceramics which were produced at Circagy. Here we have some of the shards that were found and analyzed. And we know they were made there because they found wasters, which are unfinished pieces of unfinished pot, which were rejected by the potter during the um, production process. And the uh, Sometimes they, they find tripod stilts which are used to stack bowls on each other when they're firing. And this is what one of these vessels would have looked like when it was whole. And then and these are examples of the white wares which were made at Circuitry. And they have very fine walls, as you can see from this illustration here from finds from the Great Palace. And some were randomly painted and others, very many of them uh, have these animals. Some of them are fantastic animals and some of them you can almost recognize like as this one, as a hare. And this is the only known production center in Istanbul, Constantinople. And I, I put this in to show you, this is a, a clay bed from which pottery was made. This isn't in Constantinople, but this is what raw clay looks like when you go to the, the potter goes to collect it to make his um, his pottery. Now these productions at Circuitry are from the late Byzantine period, and we still don't know where early Byzantine ceramics were produced in the city. At Constantinople, red slipped. Roman style wares were still the popular choice for open shapes, such as bowls and dishes, early in the seventh century, when white bodied table wares were first in use. And the white wares were usually closed shapes, that is jugs for use at table, or these goblets here for drinking. Now ignore this, this, what, this is something which is irrelevant. So these are unglazed jugs, unglazed goblets for drinking from and these are made from the white clay and these are the first Byzantine white clay vessels we have in the city and I think it's it's significant for a couple of reasons one if you have an upset tummy you're not feeling well you know that the kaolin is one of the things the doctor will prescribe for settling your tummy so if you keep your liquids in an unglazed vessel made basically of kaolin, it will have a, a very efficacious effect. And it was believed that it helped to prevent uh, tummy upsets. I don't think it prevented them, but it certainly made them feel better. The other important fact is that all the red wares, which were in used at the same time as these white wares, were plates and bowls. And they were imported from the coast of Asia Minor and from North Africa. And the fact is, it's much easier to stack open shapes 
uh, to, to, to create a bulk cargo than it is to carry closed ships because, well, because of the amount of space each vessel takes up. So you can get maybe 10 bowls in, an, in a space where you would only get one or two jugs. And so they, they overlapped for a while, the, this sort of pottery. And then, then we have, have began to have in the eighth century up to the 11th century, we began to have these glazed white wares. And many of them had these impressed decorations you can see here. And they had these strange cutouts. And the fact that they have these little ridges here, which are very clear and here, indicate that these are ceramic versions of metal originals because these ridges have no proper function. And it's a, a general rule that if you have a pot which has some feature, which doesn't have a, a function beyond decoration, it's, uh, it's because it was a feature on the, on the metal original. And uh, these, these little lines, I think you can see, um, you can imagine very clearly the, what the metal original was like. These are more of the shapes uh, that you can find in these early whitewares. Again, drawings of the similar sorts of vessels we saw before, goblets, all the different styles of impressed wares, many of which used classical and uh, Middle Eastern mythological themes. And so it, it, there are a kind of continuation of the classical world. And um, these dog, to, what they call these dog tooth cut out rims were very typical of this eighth century whiteware production. And here are a couple more, a very rare preserved lid showing how how these vessels, some of them anyway, functioned at table. So all forms could be either glazed or unglazed and glazing probably made the pots more expensive as well as easier to clean. And while the earliest glazed tablewares appeared in Constantinople around about AD 600, they were being produced as early as the fourth century in Egypt and the Levant. And these glazes were essentially lead glazes, but the earliest Byzantine glazes could also include alkaline or alkaline fluxed glazes. And I'm going to come back to that at a later point. Now I want to move on to some kitchen wares. And this is a very typical assemblage of what you would find in the Byzantine kitchen involved in the preparation of food. But of course, some of these things uh, could also have been used at table. Um, they, they, there's not a strong line between uh, vessels that were used for food preparation in the kitchen and plain vessels that were used at table. But of course the cooking pots, the fireproof cooking pots like this and this uh, had to be used in the kitchen over the fire. And here um, is a rather fanciful arrangement of what it was thought that a Byzantine kitchen might have looked like. And there would indeed have been metal uh, cooking pots. Um, the different shapes and sizes of pot were for different foods. And here we have a, a colander, which um, is not very common. And this is a, a so-called frying pan, but it's a very small one. So it was probably used for making sauces for pouring over something. And then here we have these two, these two cooking pots. Now the different sorts of cooking pots were used for in different ways. And this, this is what they call a, a stew pot in which you would, you could have used this today. It has, you see it has a rim so we can set a lid on it. This is a, a different sort of a cooking pot. 
And it's very interesting because this pot, this type of pot became very common from the 13th century onwards. And in uh, cookery books, we have references to um, their discussions about how to cook chickens. And it became very fashionable from the 13th century on for some time to cook chickens standing upright because it was claimed that the resulting cooked chicken was much more nutritious than a, cooking, a chicken that was cooked flat or roasted. They would have been boiled standing upright. And then this has led people to suggest that these elongated cooking pots, which otherwise would have been quite difficult to use, were um, used for cooking chickens upright. Now, these are chafing dishes and they're an interesting and a very distinctly Byzantine vessel. They typically consist of two compartments, an upper bowl, an upper bowl shaped part attached to a lower hollow stand, the latter being perforated with ventilation holes and a larger opening through which combustible material can be fed into the stand. And the bowl is typically lead glazed on its interior, which suggests a need for uh, impermeability. You can see the lead glaze here on this preserved piece. This is restored. Um, but they're not all glazed, and I, I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, three fueling methods have been proposed as he heating methods for these wares, charcoal, a small candle or a small lamp. And modern tests in, the, in laboratories have suggested that a lamp was by far the most efficient way of heating this vessel. Um, I suspect that in some circumstances, uh, charcoal was also used. And other, on other occasions, they could be heated just by setting next to an open fire. And scholars have debated whether these vessels have been employed to cook food stuff or to keep already cooked food warm, though it's generally thought that chasing, chafing dishes were associated with the serving of hot sauces, particularly garum. And since garum is a watery sauce, it would make sense to serve it in a non-porous ware that is made impermeable with a sealant such as glaze. And interestingly enough, as not all chafing dishes have internal glaze in their bowls. That surely tells us they were used for a wide range of purposes. Other propositions correlate the ware with the cooking of diverse substances from soups, vegetables, and aromatized hot wine to small morsels of solid food, such as eggs, fishes, meat, or bread buns. And the burning of incense has also been speculated as has use in the manner of a Turkish mangal, that is to serve warm, already prepared food. And yet another suggestion is that chafing dishes were used for delicate dishes that required a steady, gentle heat. For me personally, one of the most interesting things about chafing dishes is that they're common in the countryside and are particularly associated with pastoralists. And it's, they're found in the countryside to the extent that you could almost say that the very simple uh, red ones with a blob of brown glaze in them were part of a shepherd's kit when he was out on, for long treks with his sheep. But at the same time, these elaborate versions like this one I'm showing you here, they were produced and they would not have looked out of place on the most elegant of dinner tables. So I, I, the, the chafing dish, which is a particularly Byzantine vessel, I think is a, um, very interesting in how it was used across a wide stratum of society. Now ceramics performed an important function in all households as storage containers. And there are two basic types open and closed, open storage vessels like this one for dry stores 
could either have no rim or a heavy ledge around the upper edge to facilitate lifting. And closed storage pots, like this pithos, they had narrow openings which widened out at the centre of the pot and then tapered either to a flat base or a point. And that's because they would have been buried uh, up to their widest point in the floor of a basement, which kept their contents cool and preserved the, the life of the contents. And I included this picture, which many of you will recognize a pithos that was found in Turkey in the autumn. And the, the human beings provide a very good scale to give you an indication of just how much you could store in these. And this is how the basement of a, a country house might have looked, or even a townhouse, with some uh, storage pots in it. And these are the types of storage pots that you would have found in the Byzantine world. And uh, of course, they had these flat bases to facilitate setting down. And these are what we would think of as medium term storage. Whereas here we have the, the scene of the marriage of Cana, where we have the, a longer term storage. It's, there's still these flat jars, which aren't they're not as big as a pithos, but they're um, every scene in which we see the marriage of Canaan uh, displayed. We always have these very large jars from, and the wine is decanted from these vessels into these or into the, this to serve. Now these are, this, these are what are known as the Gunsen and One amphoras, and they were the most common Middle Byzantine amphora, and they're associated with the estates of the monastery of Ganos in Thrace, not very far by sea from Constantinople. So that the principal market for the goods in these amphoras was Constantinople. At Sarachene, Gunsen and One accounted for 50% of all amphora from that period. And their common currency is in the city is further supported by the discovery of ships loaded with them in the excavation of the silted up Theodosian Harbor, as well as the large numbers of them lying on the key, key side. So this is how the city was supplied these, with these domestic ceramics. Well, now I'm going to move to a very, um, I suppose you would say luxurious type of ceramic, which is known as, as polychrome ware. And I've given you this picture to show you just how varied it could be. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't common and it's colorful decoration with combinations of green or yellow lead glazes, matte red clay solution, a turquoise alkaline glaze and a manganese tinted lead glaze. All these combinations made it extremely eye catching, as you can see here. Now, these examples show the problem with Byzantine alkaline glazes, which I referred to a little while ago. They were unstable and they either decayed or fell off, while lead glazes subjected to the same post-depositional compositions normally retain their luminos luminosity. So what we have here is we have a decayed alkaline glaze, but on the same vessel, and this is a tile, we have a shiny lead glaze, and we have the same here. The alkaline glaze has decayed the lead glaze stays as it was when it was made. And here we have more examples of decayed um, alkaline glazes. And sometimes it's difficult to appreciate what the original object looked like. 
because when this object was new, the turquoise color was very brilliant blue. And the use of both lead and alkaline glazes in the early years of the production of glazed pottery at Constantinople was part of wider regional trends in the East Mediterranean at that time. But the application of both on the same objects at the same time was a distinctly Byzantine phenomenon. Even with its unique appearance, its rarity should always be borne in mind. From the Sirachene excavation, some 200 polychrome vessels were found, as opposed to more than 20,000 plain glazed whitewares. Now, these are the insides of some very highly decorated polychrome cups, and they have these plain insides with crosses and variations of crosses on the floor. And it's thought that polychrome cups with crosses in the floor had a very specific function rather than just to drink tea. These even armed crosses with overcrossed ends like this and like this. They're an early form of cross depiction, which had either become fossilized in its representation or developed and infilled in later centuries. And it's thought that to have a cross and to have one in that location, visible when drinking, meant that a vessel so decorated must have played some part in the Christian ritual. And Zaleskaya, a Russian ceremonist, made an association between these cups and a prescription in the apostolic canons that everyone undergoing baptism should be given some milk mixed with honey at the end of the ceremony. She demonstrated that this was not supplied from the communion chalice and with some linguistic arguments associated polychrome cups with the final stage of the baptismal ritual so that the newly baptized saw a cross when they had finished drinking their milk and honey. And her argument was also sustained by the indisputably religious location of, the, of many of the fine spots of these cups. Now, we talked about storage wares and religious cups and uh, what cooking pots, pots in the kitchen. And now we'll go on to the, the kind of pottery which most people think of as Byzantine ceramics, these glazed dishes with um, decoration on them. And here I've shown you, as you can see, this, although it's a 16th century picture, I don't think it was very different to how this fish would have been cooked all through time. And here it is served on a, on a dish. And here we have, looks extraordinarily similar, this, this fish. And what we have here is the, these interesting motifs, which were identified some years ago by Eunice Maguire as, a, as the falconer's lure. And this, these would have been, a hunter would have held this on his arm and waved his arm up and down uh, to summon back his falcon when he was hunting. And this, this shows that the dishes were often decorated with the food that people were eating. They're not, these aren't just sort of random pictures that, uh, so we have a, a water bird and this Kufesque design is a, a stylized foliage to show that he's out in the wild. So here we have a, a little rabbit, who's a little rabbit or a hare. It's probably a hare because of the length of his ears. Here we have a deer, this is for vet serving venison. And here we have another rather stylized looking creature, which could be, which must be a deer because of the length of his tail. And um, these dishes uh, show what was eaten. And here, here we have the, uh, the falconer. Again, these are the hunters because the other scenes which you find on bulls are hunting for animals. So here we have the falconer 
again. And here we have the, the, the lure, the, the falconer's lure, which I talked about earlier, decorating the side of the bowl. And here we have someone who's out probably hunting deer, and but he's also got nets. So he could have been hunting rabbits and hares or even fish. But these, these little things here with weights at the bottom are what he threw around the animal's legs to bring them down before he went in for the, to kill them. And the, these, these um, implements were also used by foot soldiers in the army. To, they, were used, they were used against cavalrymen to bring down horses. And here are some various dining tables. So here we have the emperor with his uh, metal plates and various metal bowls and uh, at dining at his table with his nice padded footstool. Here we have what you would have found in a, a village house. Um, they would have sat on the floor at this, at this little table. And this is just a, a sample of the sort of tablewares which you, you would find. Now, not all, but, but some uh, of these very beautiful Byzantine bowls were based on silver. They copied silver versions. And here, are, I'm, I'm just showing you a couple of these silver plates. Both of these forms are very common, this, this form and this form in the 11th and 12th century pot pottery production in Constantinople. And these are the sort of plates that, that you find which are copies of these metal originals with this very beautiful kufesque, which is what it's called, decoration around here, made by a potter who didn't, couldn't read Arabic and just turned Arabic letters into a decoration. But the, this very fine work, which must have taken a long time to execute, created these substitute metal vessels. And this is another one of the, the techniques which were used was painting. And you have here what's called slip painting. So this would have been a white slip. And this decoration was painted onto this red body and then covered in a green glaze. So you can see the red body here, which then goes dark green when it's directly on the body, but over the white slip is light green and creates a contrasting pattern. This is just painted in green and dark brown colors. And here we have a combination of the scraffito that you saw with some very fine scraffito with these green and brown painted spirals. This is a very typical vessel of the 12th century. And, and that's all, all the kind of examples that I, I wanted to show you. But I want you to think, did, did pottery production ever stop in this great city? Some destructive events are such that there's a tendency to think that everything stopped at that point, particularly if an author on a rhetorical role describes the results in the starkest of terms. And this is manifestly untrue when such an event as the capture of Constantinople in 1204 by the Crusaders is considered objectively. There's no restraint in the historical records in the descriptions of the acts of barbarity and looting that went on for four days. And indeed the quantities of spoils still extant in Western Europe are testimony to its extent. But did it lead to the complete collapse of every aspect of the functioning of everyday life? Clearly civic structures ceased to function in the manner they had up to that point. But of interest here is the question did pottery continue to be made? And of course the answer is yes, as the city continued to be occupied 
and those living there needed the ceramic accoutrements of everyday living, cooking pots and plates and water jars just to exist. This essay began with the image of God the potter making mankind, and now we know that man is a constant consumer of pots. Thank you.